2,000 years ago, there was a voice crying in the wilderness. <clears throat> but in every generation, God has a voice crying. And the wonderful man that we've been privileged to be with these several years is indeed a voice crying in the wilderness. And that voice is doing something different than most evangelists are doing in our nation. That voice is crying primarily to the church rather than to the sinners outside the church. Because the real answer is not in more in a multitude of conversions. The real answer is in God's people being what God wants us to be. For according to the Holy Scriptures, you and I are a channel for salvation. That if God can get us to demonstrate His love, if God can get us as He has cried for Israel and as He has cried for the church to be a witness for His reality and His love in this world, we can do something for somebody that's seldom done in all of history. And that's make us one. We cannot come here as the church with very much pride for we are splintered into so many sects that we must be humble. Yet God, our Lord Jesus, died for one church, shed his blood, that you and I would speak with one voice. And we look at the passage in Paul, and we think it's wonderful, but apparently we just ignore it. When Paul, crying to the Corinthians, said, I would that you be perfectly joined together, all speak the same thing, and have no divisions among you. Dr. True Elton Trueblood, one of the greatest men of God in our world today, the great Quaker philosopher, said this, the next best thing to being great is to walk with the great. I don't have a lot of sense, and that's not humility talking, that's fact. But I do have this much. I am not great. But I do know someone who is. And that man left all to walk with God and to walk such a trail that he could bring what church would listen to him to the way of God's path and to actually live the scriptures and to do God's will. If you please, he is a voice crying in the wilderness that these, these incomplete things in our hearts would be filled up. This lack of love and compassion and forbearance and that these mountains of criticism and, and of discontent would be leveled and that there would be a highway built in the desert of our heart. I do not know whether there will be a literal battle as most scholars or many scholars think in the, in the, in the uh, valley of uh, Armageddon at Medic Megiddo. But I do know this, that the book of Revelation is the picture of the human heart Unfortunately, my own heart. And with that knowledge, I cry. Oh God, slay me. Oh God, help me to follow thee. That I may experience a cross. A cross that will take out of me what has hurt people for so many years. A wrong word spoken at the wrong time lack of wisdom, not knowing to keep quiet when I should be quiet, stumbling through a beautiful garden and tearing down beautiful plants, hurting people, perhaps because I've had 
a little more than someone else. I believe God's answering that prayer. I believe that my hurts, I believe that my pain, I believe that my suffering, I believe that things that I cannot mention to you have contributed toward some measure of humility that never was there before. And may God bring me low enough that when the showers come, that it'll fill up this gully and make me a blessing to my family, to my church, to my nation, and indeed to this nation of Israel, both Arab and Jew, and all men everywhere. For they have desires and they have a heart just like I have. If you want to know the truth, the man that we follow is not just another man. I friend, he's a man, but not just another man. I can find no man in our Christian land that walks consistently with God. I can find no man who walks so that God can tell him when to stop and when to go. I looked, I looked, I searched, and I read. And when I heard that there was such a man, not absent from human faults, but a man that was willing to do God's will no matter what the cost or what people thought of him, I thought, here is my chance not to be great, but to walk with someone who is great. He is great because he is little. He is great because he thinks himself to be nothing, and he really does. And Socrates never found anyone before the time of Christ who thought, who knew themselves to be nothing. The oracle of God said to Socrates, you're the wisest man on the face of the earth. He said, God's wrong this time. He's never been wrong before, but he's wrong this time. And he, his whole life was to find at least one man who was, who, who was reportedly, who was really wise, that was reportedly wise. In all of his life, hear me, he never found one man. I have a string of degrees also. I've walked among men who said they were men of God. But I never walk with anybody that can keep their mouth shut and not criticize someone else. Nor ever I have I walked with a person that would go into the, these meetings like he's gone night after night with making no plans and being willing to look like a fool. And at times, he looks exactly that way. But he's not. He's not because he's dependent on somebody that's smarter than any man that walks this earth. And his name is Jesus. God is greater and knows all things. I have a letter in my room now that I cannot reveal to you because the person wants it kept silent. But if you knew just what happened in the meeting last night or the night before, you would say, my Lord and my God. If it hadn't have been for Brother Ham being able to hear God's voice and say, um, it's number seven on your list. It's number eight over here. It's over here. It's over there. If he hadn't been willing to have been slain, if he hadn't been willing to look like a fool, if he hadn't been willing to do God's will at any cost, he never could have gotten that program. That program came from God. That program, if you please, there's a voice crying in the wilderness because most of us want to fix it up a little bit and we just cannot believe that God doesn't approve of it just a little bit. The truth of the matter is he doesn't approve of anything that's fleshly. Flesh has to be slain so that he may have all the glory. Church of John the Baptist. But a church today, as far as I'm concerned, that commemorates another man who is a voice crying in the wilderness who does not want me to build him up. And if you hear me right, I'm not doing it. But the carnal heart will often think so. If you think that, you haven't heard right. I'm talking about a nothing man. 
but a man who's connected his nothingness with the everythingness of God and oh what it's done for my life oh what it's done for my church oh how he's taught us to love Israel oh how he's taught us to love the Arab people oh how he's taught us to love all people of all nations and get this awful awful judgmentalism out of our hearts out of our hearts and by the way isn't it wonderful when you get that away from you you suddenly find a little of what our Lord meant when he said my yoke is easy and my burden is not light. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. When you're trying to judge someone else and when you're trying to line somebody else, you've got a big job. You've got God's job and he's the only one that can do it. But when you eliminate all that and you treat all men as if they were in victory and you love men as God loves men and let the love of God come through your heart, my friends, you are an oasis in this awful desert. And by the way, when you do it as a church, God builds a highway through the desert of your heart that brings salvation to all those that get caught into the stream. I'll tell you, it could be that this song is more than prophetic if God can get a hold of my life and your life and we can go back home not to build our own little kingdoms, not our little church kingdoms, not our ministries, not our little homes or even our businesses. No, no, no. To build the kingdom of Almighty God and being willing to give ourselves to the utmost. Not choosing our, not choosing our endeavors, be they missionary or be they or whatever they be. My friends, waiting till we know for sure that God's in it. Because I want you to know the littlest thing that God in is greater than the biggest thing that man was ever in. Amen. I believe the President of the United States has a right to have the militia he has under him. I believe he has a right to have men dedicated to him 24 hours a day. How could he run the President of the United States or even being one of the most important people in the world? How could he do it if he didn't have men like that? Why shouldn't we be at, why shouldn't we be at the command of one who has a greater job trying to build the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. That doesn't set well with men who love their own kingdoms. That doesn't set well with men who want their own sermons bragged upon. But I want you to know it doesn't matter who it sets well with. We need to be slain. We need to come to nothing until God can do something with us and he cannot do anything with us until we're slain. I've got hope blood in me. It needs to be slain. I've got things in me that don't need to be there. But I want you to know Almighty God has the power to take it out of me. And not leave me without personality. But if you please leave me or let me be what I was intended to be in the first place. If you please an enjoyable, good, laughing, wonderful person by the name of Oliver Hole. But absence but absent from those things that have destroyed this earth. Well, even as I've spoken, I have felt like I'm crying in the wilderness. But I guess we'll just keep crying. We'll keep helping one who is crying. God bless his wonderful heart for the price that he's been willing to pay. And so I'm so glad we opened with a song. I think we'll just sing it again. And then maybe the good man will be this. You don't have to tell him what I said. And if you've disagreed with it, that's all right. I'm not perfect anyway. But, old friend, something I've said has been worthwhile. For as I've talked to you, something has happened inside of me that tells me that I'm not the only one doing the talking. Once in a while, a prophet is anointed and God speaks through him by God's grace and mercy. And that voice then becomes not his voice, but becomes the voice of God. And Paul said, you regarded it not only as our voice, but as the word of God, which indeed it was. Occasionally, I've had the privilege of having the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And when those moments come, great are those moments when it's not just human words, but words anointed from heaven. Next time, maybe it'll be different and it will, it will follow God all the way.
I just want you to know that I believe in you, and I agree with everything you just said, and I need to hear it again, and again, and again. Keep preaching it. Keep living it. Keep following the servant of God, because my life depends on that. Our lives depend on that. The kingdom of God depends on your obedience and on your vision. I give God all the praise and the glory and sanctify in the name of Jesus. Next time. Some will have died, most will have cried, all will have felt the touch of pain, wherever we go, there's one thing we know, love conquers everything. Next carefully as I can say it. The words that have made me cry in the writings of Paul have been these words to the church at Philippi. I have no man like-minded save Timothy who will care for your affairs. For all mine their own things not the things of Christ. Scholars, if you check your exegesis carefully, your exposition, and your historical context, you'll find out that he's talking to the churches. He's not speaking to the world. He's saying to the churches, You've got your own little Sunday school program growing. You've got this and that and the other. But God has given me a vision and God has called me. A man as one born out of time. It was hard for them to get it. Why? Because he wasn't one of the twelve. And yet, the heart of the New Testament was written by a man named Paul. 
Luke wrote his gospel. Then he wrote the book of Acts. And 13 of those marvelous letters, I don't count Hebrews because no man knows. Only God knows who really wrote that. But the heart of the story, the heart of the cry, except for Jesus and his teachings, is written in the life of Paul. It gets worse before he dies. For he said, you know, Timothy, he said, don't be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of me, God's apostle. He said, at my first defense, no man stood with me. I have looked at those words and I have said, Jesus, I may not can do anything, but there's one thing I can do. I can stay with a man of God that's true and not commit this blundering area, this blundering, blundering era of the early church again. I'm underscoring a little bit of what I've already said. I'm saying it because I believe the hour is late. I'm saying it because I believe God deserves our all. And I'm saying it because Paul was a man who's much like our own, Brother Ham. Not the same, but much like our own. And it seems to me that the same principles apply. Oh, the vision that's in that heart. Oh, the vision that's in that book. <laughs> and so, we can be assured of this, that whatever God is doing, our times are in His hands, and His will and His purpose will be worked out. One of the main songs that they have brought to us uh, Reverend Mrs. Helm, is this song, My Times Are In Thy Heads. And I thought it'd be good if we could uh, have this sung at this time. My Times Are In Thy Hands. My times are in Shakespeare said, let, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. If in my sharing you have wondered who is the biggest impediment 
for the whole operation. It happens to be the speaker. And therefore, this speaker desires your prayers. Some decade ago, I asked Dr. Hem, what can I do to get ready for waiting on God? It was the next one at that time. And he said to me, Oliver, obey God moment by moment. And something happened to me that I believe happened, has happened oftentimes to Christian people when the way seems higher than we can attain, and this way is much higher than we can attain, and only supernaturally can we attain it. But my mind locked up, and I said, well, it's impossible for me to follow God moment by moment. And when I said that, I was stopped. Unbelief locked me up for a number of years. <coughs> Wonderfully, one day, it came to me what had happened. I said, my Lord, what have I done? And if I could tell you of the years of heartache between the time that I, that I locked my heart up, I didn't resent it. I just didn't believe it. And when I finally began to break open that God could help me to walk with him moment by moment, you probably all would go to your knees and cry and cry hard. I don't want you to do that, but I want you to pray for me. That God would help me to give my life moment by moment every day. <coughs> in following him to the point where my heart can be made trustworthy. It's a great thing to find out that the heart isn't trustworthy. Jeremiah surely did tell us, didn't he? But it took me a long time to find out how untrustworthy it is. I say this because I don't want you offended but I do want you to know that I'm the person most in need and I covet your prayers. I covet your prayers that God will visit my soul and restore me and restore to my heart to Christ likeness until when I deal with my family and I deal with my church family and I deal with men and women of other nations that they may be taken a little back also. I don't see any man make, beating any path to my door. But I know that when self is slain, they'll come because it'll no longer be me. And the great shock about Brother Helm's life that I discovered was that men who were angry with him were not angry with him at all. How can you be angry with a man who's so ethical? How can you be angry with a man who's so sweet? How can you be with anger with a man who gives and gives and gives? How can you be well, you can be angry the same way they were with our Lord? Because that life is a rebuke. But it's not him that people are angry with. The more Christ is revealed in the life, the angry the world gets. They want the fruit of all this but they do not want the means by which it comes, and it comes through the cross. Right. So before they sing their last number, and I've been told that he's not going to be able to be with us today, can you imagine my surprise in being the one speaking and our choir being the one? I came up here with joy, but had I known this, <laughs> I would have been joyful in the Lord, but I'd have been a whole lot different. A lot of times it's better not to know what's yes, going to happen. Yes, yes. <laughs> But I say to you that you look at one of, the, one of the greatest needs, one of the men who's in greatest need in this world, and his name is Oliver Oak. And it seems to me if I don't get to where God wants me soon, I would rather die than live. And I'm going to have to die to live, that's for sure. But if you've got room in your prayers, Lines before they reach the 
the uh, reaping fields. I want in that harvest of righteousness. I want in it with you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for Scott Depot. Four years I prayed from, 40, from 84 to 88 that God would do with me whatever it would take to bring my people to oneness. I got a big surprise in 88. He said, leave Scott Depot. Go to Parker. Pray for my servant. And it dawned on me just a few weeks ago that that was part of the answer. Oliver, you get out of there. And I will make your people one. And it brought a happiness to my heart. (laughs) Eliminate me, Jesus. But you know something? There's a greater peace in my heart than there's ever been before. I cannot tell you the joy of living in Parker City, yet being the pastor of Scott Depot Christ Fellowship. I can't tell you the joy of it. I can't tell you the joy of having an address on Fulton Street. I never dreamed of such. But the Bible says he's able to do exceeding abundantly above more than all we ask or think according to the power that works within us. I guess this last song sums sums it up. If God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? In all things, in all things, we are more, are more than conquerors. Through Him that loved us, through Him that loved us, we are more than conquerors. He that gave, that gave His own Son, that gave His own Son for us all, shall we not, shall we not through Him, through Him, give us all things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us?